Mary Harron, everyone, um, you know her work. <laughs> <laughs> Director of films including Dali Land, Charlie Says, the Margaret Atwood adaptation, Alias Grace, The Moth Diaries, Who Shot Andy Warhol, a series of uh, remarkable attempts to bridge the mainstream and the transgressive of cult classics of films that are finally receiving their due. Um, it's so great that you could be with us tonight to talk about American Psycho and literary adaptation. Um, I thought I'd start by asking you about a couple of things uh, that you mentioned in the introduction that we played before the screening, um, and then we'll turn to audience questions and then I'll intervene with a few questions if people are shy. Um, firstly, you talked about um, the humor in the film. Uh, mm -hmm. or rather the humour in the book, uh, and how kind of that was the defining experience of reading the book for you. Um, I'm wondering if you feel like the film is funny in the same way that the book is funny. Mm, you know, uh, you know, it's so hard to say because, you know, they merged in my mind. And I think what Guinevere and I did was select the funniest bits. You know, when we our first real pass on the script was just taking out taking everything we liked uh, in the book and just like putting it in a document. And a lot of that was the, the dialogue. I mean, and you can't separate the um, the humor out from the scary bits or the dark bits either because they, they uh, work together. Um, but I mean, in terms of Brett's, you know, fantastic ear for dialogue and the way, I think one of the things he was catching um, about New York in the 80s and New York now and 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 the modern world generally, you know, is an obsession with surfaceness, surfaces and and detail and appearance. And with his friends, you know, th there's one scene that I would have loved to include in the film, and it just didn't make it where they're they're arguing brutally over thin crust pizza and who this where the best thin crust pizza is. And it's just this intense, and it it's hilarious in, in the book. It's this hilarious sort of passion for you know trivial things. Um, so in in the film, part of the comedy of Bateman is is him taking these things so seriously. Um, and one of my favorite moments in the book and and in the film is when he he walks into a restaurant and says he realizes that he's being given a decent table and says relief washed over me like an awesome wave. Um, something that we say to each other sometimes when we enter restaurants. And uh, my husband and I just as a joke. Um, but I think that there's there's that taking everything so so seriously. So I think that's the same. But I don't know. It would take someone who's just read the book to tell me. I think, I mean, the interesting thing about this particular screening was that people were laughing really throughout. <laughs> I thought, so I've, I've noticed that. That, uh, that was not true before, I tell yeah, you. Yeah, no, I do. I think that's interesting. Has that Has that kind of idea that it's, it's so clearly a satire that is to mm. be laughed at in a particular way. Has that escalated over time? Well, I, mean, I think when when it premiered at Sundance, um, which was very sort of rocky kind of, uh, there were a lot of people there, but it was quite a rocky screening because I, you know, the book had this sort of hellfire reputation, um, and and all the thing about that they threatened demonstrations and it was supposed to be really misogynist, and. Um, and I think people did not know. So they think that they're seeing something horrifying and dark and, and about murder and 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 the and about violence against women. And then a lot of it is kind of, you know, this sort of satirical stuff about, you know, um, um, you know, Huey Lewis or whatever, you know. Um, so people were just kind of in shock, really, and uh, and didn't know which way to. So I, 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 my memory is that the only people laughing were me and Christian and my editor and, you know, my husband and my sister, you know, but I mean, I'm told that in fact, there were actually some other people laughing. Um, uh, I'm interested in the, the scene that you specifically picked out in your introduction, which is the, the secretary scene mm. you identified as specifically not being based mm. on dialogue in the book. Yeah. And I just wanted yeah. to talk about the role that that plays in the film um, and the ways in which that potentially shapes the difference between the film and the book. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's a, a, a quite a there's a scene in the book with a prost young prostitute, uh, Sunny, maybe I think, and and um, whatever, um, 
and he he picks her up and there it's there's a sort of odd moment of humanity of sort of a feeling and the book sort of changes not that it becomes sentimental but that he's looking at her and he's seeing her as a human being and he says to her i think you should go now you know i think something bad will happen if you stay and it's very, because there's so little sort of humanity it was really effective in the book and i wanted to to take that character and make them bigger and to have I didn't want the victims to be anonymous. I wanted you, I, I guess that was definitely my choice, um, to take this character, amplify it, and play the scenes that she is in are pretty much played through the great actress, Kara Seymour, through her eyes. It's the point of view in those scenes shifts to her. Uh, whereas really it's it's very much Baton's POV throughout the rest of the film. And so that was my choice. I didn't want to, you know, and you could sort of tart it up and say, you know, objectify, but yeah, it was just like give her her, give her 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 humanity and her don't let the victims be anonymous and don't make the and don't make the, those killing that killing funny. I mean, it's a little funny because it's a chainsaw falling through a spiral staircase, but but I wanted you it I wanted it to have an impact and you to feel something, you know, in her fear or whatever you, and you wanted her to get away, you know, I want her to get away, but she doesn't. Yeah. Um, last question before I turn to the audience, I'm conscious that you um, are asked to speak about American Psycho a lot and <laughs> sort of have been uh, ever since it was made. Um, and so you have a kind of uh, 20, you know, 20 plus years of, um, of, <laughs> thinking of it as a moment in time um and the, the moment in time is very specific because it's you know mm -hmm. the year before 9 11 it's before the financial crash it's a decent gap with the period that it describes as you talked about in your introduction and mm -hmm. of course it's it's living in blissful innocence of how the specter of trump would become something very different yeah. um 16 years mm -hmm. on um i'm wondering how you think about adaptation and the relationship, the relationship between it and and a moment in time, um, and whether it's um, whether in some ways it's it's able to open that up, it can make a, a a work more universal because it seems to me that that's what the film achieves. It's a more universal account of of those themes and and in some ways more prophetic than the book is, which seems very locked in a particular period. Yeah, I mean it's funny because when the book when the film came out. There were some quite, um, they got a lot of bad reviews and there was some quite dismissive reviews saying, yeah, we all know about the 80s. You know, it's just like, yeah, yeah, the 80s, you know, so who cares, you know. Yeah, it was, you know, restaurants and 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 money and breed and, oh. I mean, to me, sorry, I'm about to cough. <laughs> to me, it was about, you know, vulture capitalism. <laughs> It was about the late 20th century and actually early 21st century. It was about our world now. And I always thought that it was something I, I never, even though I knew that it could have the fun of a period film by getting the details right about the eighties and a certain kind of restaurant culture and all the rest. But to me, what <clears throat> what Brett had, Brett had caught and what American Psycho is about in his creation of this now really kind of legendary monster he created is that it took everything that was really awful about the society, you know, the 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 obsession with appearance, the the uh, greed, the cruelty to the poor and the homeless, or the racism and the misogyny. You just took everything and the insecurity, the vast, which is a big thing in Trump, the narcissism and the terrifying insecurity, and 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 the fear and and panic and violence that, that emptiness and insecurity creates. And you put it on, you take all that, all those things, and you make a, a human being out of it and make him super handsome and give him beautiful clothes. And that's Patrick Bateman. And I think that that didn't depend on, on the 80s. I mean, unfortunately, I think whatever it is about a culture of cons endless consumption and status and anxiety and the fear that that creates, you know, I haven't got the right table in the restaurant or whatever, the fear that creates is is ongoing and and will be as, as as long as you have a society based on on buying things okay let's open this up to audience questions there's a roving mic so um if you could raise your hand if you have a question for mary heron 
Uh, I can see one right in the middle there. If we start. I, I saw this film in the cinema when it came out what, mm. 20, 24 years ago. And I remember at the time, Christian Bale, I only really knew him from Empire of the Sun when he was quite young. And mm. I remember vividly the Leo DiCaprio saga. So any mm. comments or memories in Heinz? Because Christian Bale is arguably almost as big a star now as Leo is. You know, he's mm. an Oscar winning act. So, so what's the sort of all these years later, what's the thoughts on that? Because it was almost a completely different film, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I never wanted to cast DiCaprio, and that's why I was fired from the film, because I didn't want to cast. And as soon as they called, I had already cast Christian when they said that they wanted to cast DiCaprio because he had read the script and, and wanted to do it. But they called me and said, we're going to, the budget's still going to be six million, but we're going to get pay him 20. <laughs> Um, and I just said, that's the stupidest idea I ever heard. And, and he, he just come off Titanic. So, you, you know, I said, you can't, you can't cast someone who's the idol of a million, a billion 15 year old girls in this role. Um, and also I kind of knew that this film would only work if it was absolutely, I, I could, I could have complete control of the tone and really get that right and have, you know, as little interference with that as possible. Um, and I knew, you know, once they thought they could cast DiCaprio, I didn't realize at the time they'd already fired me because I had only made one movie and I wasn't famous. And he wanted, you know, at, at one point, you know, after they fired me, it was going to be Oliver Stone. Um, but he wanted either, you know, Stanley Kubrick or Scorsese or, you know, a super, super big director. Um, and at, at the time, though, I didn't realize that I had already been fired. So I, I made what I thought was a very principled stand. And also because I just thought he was wrong. I mean, to be honest, if I thought that DiCaprio was, was perfect for the casting, it would have been very difficult for me probably to stand with Christian as much as I, I I liked him. But in this case, I just, it was an easier decision. I thought he is really wrong for this. Uh, and I like him as an actor, but he's not this character. And also that you, that because he was a beloved of so many teen girls, you could not afford, you could not cast him. And, and that there was something that, that, that Christian was, you know, really understood it and was right for it. So um, I made my stand, even though not realizing I'd already been fired. And then they, you know, it fell apart. They couldn't, they couldn't, they couldn't agree on the script. And in the end, they, they, you know, we got it back and Christian and I were able to do it. But I have to say it was the biggest, the biggest uh, gamble I ever did. And, and very upsetting. Um, I remember my husband saying, you look, you like, You've just been through a car crash, you know. Um, and I understood for the first time in, in my life, I guess having led a sheltered life, what it's like to be somebody who just gets fired, you know, because their services are no longer required. And what it's like for millions of people who just get thrown out of all the work they've done, just thrown out, you know. So it was like a lesson in, you know, the real world. Um, how did you watch Wolf of Wall Street with that? kind of trajectory in mind i mean i think it's you know um i mean it's a fun movie i will always love the scene where he's on quaaludes um i have pro my i have problems with that movie just because i think the characters i think it endorses the character too much but you know it's a different movie it's a different character it's not in some ways it's more of a celebration i think than, than my film is okay i, think Which I hope it's not a celebration even though there's a lot of wall street guys who love american psycho <laughs> no surprise it <laughs> game respects game uh i think i saw a, an arm up in the very back row mm. thank you um i i wonder if i could uh sneak two questions in because i was wrestling between the two um Quick. one i was very curious about if you could comment on um particularly with a background in writing about music uh john kale and the soundtrack um, and then also, I haven't seen it, but talk about people not understanding at the time. I know there's a sequel with Mila Kunis and William Shatner. And I was oh, wondering yeah. if you could comment on both the John Cale soundtrack and the sequel that happened. Okay. Well, John was an old friend of mine that I'd known since the sort of New York punk days. I was a big fan of his and he used to always go to his shows. And he, and, um, um, he had started a record label with a friend of mine. And um, and so I asked him to do this the score for my first film for Aisha Andy Warhol. And so you know I, I asked him again, and uh, I don't know I think we played a lot of a lot of Bernard Herman to him, <laughs> a lot of Hitchcock stuff. 
Um, but yes, he, he, you know, he's um, he's a great, great artist. It was hard to pin him down because he was always on tour, but it worked out well. Um, so was that, is there another question in there? And the sequel. Oh, the sequel. Oh, I never saw it. But I think they're, they're trying to do another one. You know, they're always trying, they're trying, I think Lionsgate, it, people always want to want to squeeze everything dry. Um, I will always have nothing to do with it, a sequel. <laughs> But they're trying to do they're trying to do an updated version, which is funny because it's such a different world. I mean, you would really have to change it because I don't I don't think that anybody would be as openly misogynist or as openly, you know, they it would all be covered with sort of sort of a the glaze of of uh, political correctness now, even while you were doing the same awful things. Brett Easton Ellis but, might. <laughs> what? Brett Easton Ellis <laughs> might. Yeah, well, no, he might, you know. And and you know, God bless them. But I I would have, I don't I never want to have anything to do with the sequel. Just on him, um, I know that you uh, have a, a kind of affectionate um, relationship and and mutual respect. But I am mm. conscious that it sounds like you are sort of broadly coming from the same position as as you had when you were making the film. Whereas obviously Brett has been on something of a journey, um, mm. and mm. the journey tracks in kind of interesting ways with certain aspects of the politics of of the of the subject i just wonder how you feel about the potential uh growing distance between uh your perspective as the filmmaker and his perspective as the author of the text yeah i haven't this is about his podcast right uh i which i haven't listened to i just i just I, get I, you know i think brett likes to annoy i don't even know how serious all that is you know, and I feel like he's almost arguing with I'm sure he lives in a world of the liberal intelligentsia. And I think he's more like trying to offend them. That's, that's what I suspect. He'd be annoyed at me saying that. But it doesn't feel like it's a deeply, deeply held right wing views. You know, I think he's just irritated by by young people, you know, being self-righteous. But that's that's the job of young people. <laughs> well put. Uh, I think there was a question in front row. Um, sorry. Mm -hmm. The mic. Hi, hello. Uh, I also been, of course, an audience for this film for around twenty years. Uh, but I'm curious because I never see uh, a lot of questions or a lot of discussion about the more ambiguous aspects of this film, because mm -hmm. um, it is it is as a matter of fact the film ends on this weird note where suddenly Patrick mm -hmm. Bayman's whole world get turns upside down sort of right and, mm -hmm. and everything is suddenly put into question so i was uh, even like as an audience member i met so many even people from around the world foreign audiences who don't really uh, understand english that well and they're not even completely aware of all the you know all the wall street new york all that world so mm. it's really funny i i would just like to ask you about the about all this you know, from a literary perspective and a filmmaking aspect and doing American Psycho as a film, uh, what do you think of all these ambiguous things of uh, of the narrative? Well, I think Brett thinks it's more ambiguous than I do. Um, I'm not saying there's not some ambiguous things, but I would say I never liked that. I would never like the idea that this one's like, oh, it was all a dream or oh, it was all in his head. So I wouldn't say it's all in his head, but I'm not going to say what is real and what's not because uh as quentin tarantino says if i tell you i'll take the film away from you you know it's for you to it's your film when you watch it and you decide what it means i'll also say one thing that obviously when he's trying to put a kitten in an atm <laughs> and the atm is speaking to him then obviously he's not playing with a full deck there and <laughs> and that is not realism but there's other things of the violence or whatever that i think are real but i'm not going to say what they are and that's for you to your personal experience of the movie to work out um, we have a couple of questions in the middle row. If we could come to the lady in the glasses first. Um, hi. Yeah, I wanted to talk more about the misogyny aspect because I'm I think I'm quite a lot younger than a lot of people here. So I actually first saw American Psycho the same time I saw The Wolf of Wall Street, and mm -hmm. I agreed with you when I watched The Wolf of Wall Street. I felt I didn't feel like it was really. I can't really think of how to say what I mean, but like you said, I thought it was kind of glamorizing 
how he treats mm. the women in the film and I didn't really like that I found that a bit uncomfortable but I've never I watched American Psycho and I never felt that any of the violence was glamorized here and I thought that you handled it really really well and I kind of wanted to ask about how you went about how you approach that how you because obviously the book I've read the book as well is quite violent and how you just it, thought about adapting that in a way that was mm. not disrespectful I know it's it's difficult because you know you you want to be respectful to the book but you even more you want to be respectful to to humanity and to women um when I read, started reading the book, which I was super enjoying, and then I hit like page 30 or page 40 where he starts torturing Bethany, and I just had to stop. I could not read it. I had to stop for a month. And after a month, I thought, oh, I'm going oh, I'm gonna pick it up and start again. And then I it, there's not ne never gets as bad. Um although one thing that I um oh, like I said in my intro, I like the way it shifts between safety and violence. But to me, it was very important that it, yeah, that it not be glamorized. And also, there's another thing about the sex scenes. I think in the book, they really are glamorized. They're sort of like, you know, penthouse forum fantasies or something. Um, and I wanted to make clear that these are prostitutes. So they are not having orgasms. These are, you know, and I was never sure. The, the, the sex scenes in the book read like they're Baton's male fantasy, but I don't know how deliberate that was or, the, or whether they just are male fantasy. But to me, it was like, these are prostitutes. They're really bored with what they're doing. This guy's weird. And so that was my direction to them. And 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 the the both the women uh did a fantastic job of just looking like sort of blank and like uncomfortable. And and it's funny because people love other scenes, but my favorite scene is when they're just sitting around and he's kind of bragging and uh and and it's just really awkward. And um, you know. Um, and he's trying, and he's sort of annoyed with them because they're not sufficiently impressed by him, you know. And so that stuff was also very important to me. It's those little moments of, of this sort of patheticness and this insecurity. And and, and something I, I meant to say before, just about the character of Patrick Bateman, is that, you know, Brett as a gay man did a fantastic critique of masculinity in this film in his, in the book which we tried to bring into the film that that there's it's you know the absurdity and the patheticness of of the the male competition and the way the guys talk and their vanity and their sort of preening um was something that I thought he caught really well you know um so and, and in terms of the violence in the book I know the violence is kind of crazy I think he immersed himself in a lot of like violent films and you know and and serial killer you know biographies when he was writing the book and gotten a kind of and that's what he told me and he got in a kind of like altered state and just wrote this stuff in like three three days or whatever just poured it out and so it is pretty <clears throat> crazy I, I personally I'm not a big fan of very you know in my work of being super graphic and I never wanted to do a lot of graphic violence also I just wanted to do more of the suggestion. And it's funny that the film now has the reputation of being very violent because there's really very, if you if you add it up, there's very little that's actually violence. It's like a uh, this one explosive sequence at the end, really. But it has that reputation. Uh, sorry, can I also ask a quick as yeah. a follow-up? What if there are any films that you look to as an other like good examples of what you've done so kind of talking about misogyny in a way that is really not glamorizing it and is doing a really good job to kind of get the message um, in an effective way feel free to think um, about it for a second mary well we, we can come back to that question if it's easy yes i'm not sure because you know it's funny because the films i was thinking of were not about you know a misogyny i was thinking more like bunuel you know just free over the porch right there that's most that's more for the social satire. I don't know. Now my mind has gone blank. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, I can agree with you about Bunuel, though. I think that's something. I don't know if he did it intentionally, but he's another filmmaker. I've kind of felt the same. I don't know if he was intentionally trying to make any feminist points, but I always thought he handled the topics he did very Yeah. Well. Yeah. And so that was, you know, and, and I think also he was, you know, in terms of like his social satire, his skewering of the rich and privileged, you know, 
like no other, you know. And and so I definitely, you know, watched that reference, that thought about his stuff when, when making this film. It's interesting that with the, the kind of stylization of the violence um, and, and of other aspects, this kind of noirish dimension mm. starts to overtake the film, um, mm. culminating in that that final uh, kind of sequence or the penultimate sequence, um, which obviously being in New York also draws attention to the fact that Bateman sounds quite a lot like Batman. And there mm, is yeah. this kind of uh, Gotham-like quality. Mm. Um, and, and it does make me think that the film is a kind of, sh it's quite a smorgasbord of different um, stylistic mm. tricks. Mm. Was, that, was that a kind of playful process for you? Or was it a necessary... Way yeah, I mean, it also, you know, the book references these, you know, because there's definitely this point where it becomes like a crazy, absurd action film when he when he when he shoots. And it's funny because this scene was actually filmed in Toronto, in the Toronto Dominion Plaza. He's running between the two identical office towers and um, and goes and shoots somebody. And there's helicopters and it's kind of diehardy. I mean, he 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 wrote that stuff with kind of a conscious, like certain 80s action films in mind. And so so there are certain times it becomes a movie. In the book, you know, that's referenced that, and and I kind of went with that. Okay, okay, now we're in, now we're in our action movie. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's a question. Yeah, next to thanks. Hi, um, I'm also quite young, maybe as an audience member, um, so I don't exactly know what it was like. Maybe uh, the tone of the culture in the late '90s, specifically, but it seems like maybe things have changed a little bit since then. Uh, maybe not so much in other ways, but um, I was just wondering, uh, having made like a, a film that comes from such a transgressive book and was also possibly a transgressive film, whether you think it's still relevant for people to make transgressive media and uh, to write things that are transgressive at the moment? And if so, how do you think that that looks in amongst the culture at the moment? Well, I mean, what is transgressive changes, doesn't it? Um, there is always there is always something transgressive, you know. Um, I, it's funny. I just uh, I was just talking to Nan Golden, who did a did a um, the artist famous artist who just uh, came out, you know, protesting. Um, and she's Jewish, and the Jewish editor of of uh, Art Forum was fired for doing something pro Palestine, and now she all galleries are dropping her. So you can be transgressive, you know. There's issues in the culture that will be transgressive, that are political now. I think, um, and there's a lot of debate about that, you know. Um, but is it is it sexual? Yes, but it'll be in a different. It'll be in a different area. Um, I mean, there's a certain kind of lip service paid to feminism now that's just a new normal. Um, but I don't, I don't know that it's really deeply held, and I don't think that those changes are structural. Um, you know, there's there's definitely things you could not say and do. Um, but but what I'm sort of interested in your question: Are there th what kind of transgressive things do you are you thinking of that you're not seeing or? Or, I don't know. Uh, I don't know, I suppose. I guess um, I feel like something like American Psycho would really struggle, obviously, to to even reach daylight today. Um, mm. And I don't know whether that's necessarily a good thing or a bad thing, because maybe we don't need it because it's already happened. But with that respect, I also feel like sometimes things feel suffocated or maybe like they're not moving or I struggle to see things that really like shock me and make me think uh, outside of what I'm kind of being fed. So I just kind of wanted to know whether there's things that you have an eye on that you're like, oh, yes, I think this is maybe where, uh, you know, this is transgressive at the moment or something. And I mean, you've given examples, so I'm I'm happy. Yeah, but I mean, I think that's 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 just like you know, there's always you know, there's always political no go areas, and 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 those those boundaries shift all the time. Um, in terms of things that are to do with um, gender, really, that's what we're talking about now. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, you 
I guess, you know, people can get in trouble, but then I wouldn't, you know, you know, I'm not a turf, so I don't, <laughs> I don't agree with those, those debates, you know, I don't support those, you know, people are attacking people who are trans. Um, just, you know, but certainly, Sarah, I don't think that necessarily okay. being transgressive just has to be uh, the yeah. opposite of whatever. About gender, kind of yeah. I don't know. I, I mean, honestly, to be honest, the way I feel about it, and having done films, both my first film, Marsha, Andy Warhol, and 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 this film were both uh, very much criticized at the time and sort of attacked at the time for being, you know, too out there or whatever, uh, and are now much are now more embraced. But there is always a status quo. You know, we had about we had about five or six years of sort of political correctness being okay and diversity being the watchword. But I don't think, but I don't think that the, the but there was still a lot of censorship and they're still trying to push kind of the same kind of sentimental whatever on you. You know, it's still wanting inspirational stories and happy endings. And it doesn't matter who, you know, I'm glad that the film industry opened up and is more diverse and that's great, but there's still a lot of, not censorship, but just like certain stories that people want to see and a certain, certain you know, control of the mainstream of the narrative, you know, that's kind of uninspiring. And, you know, the marketplace and the studios and whatever in the business generally will always want things that are more safe and, and kind of, you know, unchallenging, um, even if they swap the the people around and 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 it's a bit more diverse. Doesn't mean, you know, everything challenging is being welcomed and it never will be. And if it was, it wouldn't be challenging, right? So, but you know, yeah. If, if it's part of the question about irony um, and mm. I suppose, do you have a sense as a filmmaker of um, ironies that you felt you were in control of not necessarily being understood subsequently? Oh yeah, always, always I'd say. I mean, I, th I think a lot of people, and funny in script form, uh, I think even my husband, uh, you know, uh, our first vacation together, I had brought American Psycho with me and I was working on the script and he's like, he's like, who is this woman um, that I'm I'm seeing? And uh, he said he didn't realize until until we made the start making the film that it was supposed to be funny. And and most people. Basically, other you know, I don't think anybody in the crew did, you know, people just didn't know it was supposed to be funny. My first film, which I think is has a lot of comedy and people didn't think it was meant to be funny and you know I, the, whatever i do it doesn't obviously doesn't come across on the page because people don't know that they're really comedies semi-comedies i think we've got time for one more question if someone wants to raise a hand mm -hmm. i'll ask mary a final question i think oh yeah again the middle row about halfway down thanks I was just wondering, actually, if you could speak a bit more on that, about people's kind of reception of it. Um, I'm also quite young. I was at university last year. Everyone and... in this audience is very young. <laughs> <laughs> You're all children. <laughs> and um, it was such a, it was kind of the trend almost for boys to go on Halloween as Patrick Bateman. And I got oh. given many a uh, business card in a club. <laughs> and oh. at the, to start with, I thought it was kind of funny and then realized that it was very much, they didn't see the film as a comedy and saw kind of, ironically Bale as like kind of a Batman-esque figure and I was just yeah. wondering if you have any like experience of encountering people like that and just how you feel about it just completely as you said like Wall Street bros finance bros like loving it and just kind of not getting it I don't know you know you can't control perception of what you do I mean it's funny because one of the things that happened when the film came out was I was being endlessly attacked for the violence um and I remember being in Sundance and I was seven months pregnant, people coming, you know, up to me and, you know, how can you make this, you know, it's like you a mother, you know, and, um, I, and my feeling about this is that you cannot control, you know, and, and the fear is, oh my God, somebody's going to see it and go murder somebody, you know, and I remember being worried about that. Um, but you can't control how people will, will receive your work or, or what they do with it, you know? Uh, so there's all those, you know, assassins who read Catcher in the Rye and, it's their fate, you know, somehow it's their Bible and they go and shoot somebody. It doesn't make any sense, but you, you can't really control, um, you know, the journey, the, what, what happens to your work once people are, are experiencing it. But, but the, I think a lot of those people have probably only seen 
they may not have really watched the film. The film was very big on 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 um, Instagram and, and and TikTok. There's a lot of memes that my children send me. <laughs> um, and so I think it's experienced now, not really as a film. It's, you know, scenes on YouTube, very clever. I have to say, there's a ton of really, really unbelievably well done YouTube parodies of the business card scene. Um, but it's like, I don't know, I, I think I think it's it, it's very odd to have made this one film that has taken, that wasn't that successful when it came out and then sort of, you know, sort of grew and grew. And now has become something that's almost nothing to do with it being a film. It's almost like the character has its own, its own, you know, propulsion. <laughs> so it's a funny experience to have had. I'm afraid the bad news, Mary, is that next year is its 25th anniversary. Oh, so. God, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Ask I these questions to, to over again. Yes, I'm sorry for all these answers. I realize they're all very kind of jumbled up because I think I've talked about it so much that there's, you know, I'm afraid it's all very sort of splintered what I've been saying. It's yeah, been absolutely wonderful. Thank you. Um, just one final question. Uh, I think that part of literary adaptation is... Um, is obviously about concision because of the fact that taking a novel and turning it into a screenplay is necessarily going to involve mm. a kind of filleting. It seems mm. to me that process with this novel, because the novel is so much about a kind of excess of um, mm. of making its points, of of kind of lists and uh, and and kind of excessive description and uh, and and all kinds of kind of prolix in many ways. Um, I wonder if if the process of filleting that says something kind of essential about literary adaptation because to me it seems that what you've done is taken a taken a very flawed novel and turned it into a into a really wonderful movie um and and almost part of the process by which you've you've done that it, it sort of says something essential about literary adaptation but i don't know i mean it sounds like mostly for you it was just fun <laughs> i mean yeah uh should i comment on that um I yeah I th I think I think you it's it must be very hard for the for the author because you just have to make it make it your own and make it something it's going to be something else and no on that note, on that note. <laughs> okay uh, I'm going to hold up my mic so Mary can hear your applause <laughs> uh. <laughs> I hope some of that came through on Zoom, Mary. Uh, well, thank you very much. It was very nice for everyone to turn up. 18-year-olds applauding. Oh. <laughs> um, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, the next event in this series will be something very different, Quartet, based on the Jean Reese novel, a merchant ivory film starring Maggie Smith. As I said, a transition no one's ever made in the history of cinema. Um, <laughs> on 8th of April uh, with Miranda Seymour, Jean Reese's biographer. In the tote bag on your lap, you will find a bookmark that uh, contains a free offer to subscribe to Mubi for 30 days for free. So if you're not already a Mubi subscriber, do that. See how good it is. Also a copy of the London Review of Books, but you already know how good that is. Um, I think that's all the housekeeping. Uh, thanks and good night. And thanks again to Mary Heron. Thank you.